Okay, hello. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, autopilot uh, webinar. Today we will uh, be presenting uh, uh, one of the automated driving pilots uh, within the brain port of the uh, autopilot project. It concerns uh, automated valley parking. Uh, in this presentation, um, uh, we have several uh, presenters of parties uh, uh, involved in automated valley parking. Um, it concerns uh, Vicomtech, uh, DLR, and uh, TAS. So this is the uh, agenda. Uh, so I just made the uh, introduction of the, uh, the webinar. Uh, then I will present uh, a very brief overview of autopilot and the, the brain for pilot side uh, and some of the services that we have. Um, I've, we have seen that most of the attendees uh, are familiar with the autopilot project. Um, then uh, a presentation, a few slides will be presented by uh, TAS on the IoT configuration and the functions. Uh, this is done by uh, Amy Matthews. Uh, Vicomtech then will follow. Uh, we'll take over with the video surveillance uh, application and, uh, and then uh, DLR will present the drone application. Um, and then I will close off with uh, the next steps towards uh, the pilots. I also show some uh, results for uh, automated driving. So what about uh, the autopilot project uh, and the brain port? Well, uh, the idea of the uh, Autopilot project is a large scale pilot um, combining automated driving and Internet of Things. And uh, this is uh, uh, done by involving uh, or executing uh, automated driving use cases at uh, uh, different pilot sites, five pilot sites within Europe and one in uh, Korea. Um, and you can see we started uh, uh, last January and we're uh, just about halfway in the project duration. Uh, we have 44 partners involved, uh, also several associated uh, parties. So what is the challenge of uh, Autopilot that we are addressing? Uh, well, we have to demonstrate the added value of Internet of Things for automated driving. And uh, uh, what, oh, what, we, um, what we have uh, what we could say there's a lot of information on uh, the internet and we want to use it for uh, safety critical applications and the question is how can you do that well and the solution is internet of things um, with internet of things we can get uh, information which is beyond the reach of sensors so uh, like we could consider uh, the planned route on the navigation system you cannot assess that from sensing we also can put uh, the data that we receive in, uh, in context, so indicating uh, the level of trustworthiness, because we can only use the data if we are really uh, uh, feel secure that we can use it, convinced that we can use it. And for that, we need to indicate some uh, trustworthiness indicators. And finally, uh, of course, uh, Internet of Things is uh, a great opportunity uh, to connect uh, anything uh, as a source of information. Um, on the other end, we have automated driving. There are three levels uh, we can talk about. It's the strategic level, technical level, and operational level uh, related to travel planning, decision making, steer and speed control. And uh, where we see the application of Internet of Things is mainly uh, within the uh, decision making process of um, uh, automated driving. So the, the, the steering and the speed will not directly act on the information of uh, Internet of Things, but the decision making like which uh, uh, speed to choose or which lane to choose, that kind of application. So within the brain port, we have five different uh, use cases. Uh, the use case of car sharing considers the, uh, the whole region of um, Eindhoven and Helmond. And then uh, we have a use case uh, uh, on platooning, which is executed on the, uh, on the test road between uh, here on the A270 test side between uh, Helmond and Eindhoven. 
uh, we have the highway pilot uh, application, which also will focus on uh, on that road. Uh, we have automated fellow parking and uh, relocation, uh, and relocation uh, means to have unmanned cars driving uh, to locations where people want to have cars available. So, uh, as said, we focus in this uh, webinar on automated valet parking. And um, yeah, what what uh, does uh, IoT uh, bring for automated valet parking, or what is automated valet parking? It means that you can leave your car and the car autonomously finds its way to a parking spot and it will uh, return to you uh, on command. Of course, it has uh, several uh, benefits. Uh, it's, a, it's a comfort service. Uh, we can have more efficient use uh, of the space of the parking lots. Uh, there will be less damage uh, to cars. Uh, you can optimize the logistics uh, on parking areas and uh, we can have a more efficient use for uh, uh, of EV charging uh, spots, etc. So this is the test location we uh, are considering. This is also the location where I am now. It's the automotive campus in uh, Helmond. And uh, we have different parties. So we are here in this uh, office building. Uh, our main uh, activity on automated teleparking is the vehicle control and the Internet of Things. Uh, we have a control room of TAS. Um, they connect uh, to the monitoring system and provide uh, uh, IoT services. Um, then um, we have the facilities uh, of the parking itself and fixed cameras. They are provided by the city of Helmond. There's a camera and drone application uh, provided by DLR. DLR is actually the coordinator of the whole use case of automated valid parking. Um, they're also uh, involved in vehicle control and providing the IoT network uh, services. Uh, and then we have many camera applications that requires image processing and that is done by uh, Vicomta. And finally, of course, we need uh, vehicles to drive around and uh, the vehicles uh, uh, will be provided by uh, uh, by NEFS, uh, it's the former SAP uh, factory in uh, in Sweden. So what you can see here is the uh, situation in uh, at the campus. So we have a drop-off zone in front of the building, and then uh, there are different routes to the parking. And, uh, and the cameras will observe the roads. Uh, many times are are trucks loading and unloading to uh, for the canteen. So depending on where other traffic is around, we uh, plan the route to come to the to the parking area and of course on the parking itself you have to find uh, an empty parking spot. So this is um, uh, where we're looking at for automated valid parking. So um, we can continue on um, uh, the IoT configuration and functions. This will be uh, presented by uh, Amy Matthews and I will now make uh, uh, Amy, the presenter. So, Amy, please uh, continue. Hello, my name is Amy Matthews. I'm working at uh, TAS International. So, in the next few slides, I'm going to explain how IoT is playing a central role in this use case. So, if you look at this uh, high level architecture, diagram, you can see that literally IoT is in the center and uh, we can see that uh, there is an IoT platform. So what does this mean? Uh, what What is an IoT platform? In simple words, we can say that it's a platform that allows IoT devices to communicate with each other using the internet protocols. So if you have heard not heard of any of the IoT platform, you can name any of the top 10 or 20 technical companies and you have an IoT platform. For example, we have Amazon. The most popular ones are the Amazon Web Service or Google Cloud Platform, Cisco IoT Cloud or Oracle Integrated Cloud, Microsoft Azure. So quite a lot of IoT platforms are available in the market. And in the autopilot project, we are also fortunate to have two big players. One is IBM and IBM is having the IBM Watson IoT platform and also like uh, Huawei is there, Huawei comes with their Ocean Connect IoT platform. 
and also another uh, provider is a startup called Sensino. They are providing a 1M2M IoT platform. So we have quite a lot of IoT platforms in the project and especially in the automated wallet parking, uh, we are using two of these. One is the Watson, IBM Watson IoT platform and the second one is the 1M2M IoT platform. So uh, what is an IoT platform? So what are the functions? So how do you select the IoT platform? So this depends uh, upon the use case you have. For example, what type of applications you are looking at? Is the platform able to support or handle quite a lot of uh, high data, high stream data coming from multiple sources? So how is the uh, data, where is the data stored? Is it uh, highly secure? Is it stored in the premise or in a public cloud? Quite a lot of uh, things decide on uh, choosing up the IoT platform. And in the AVP use case, uh, we have DLR has uh, chosen the IBM Watson as their IoT platform. And uh, for the DLR has their own vehicles and also the vehicles are provided by TAS TNO. So we have uh, chosen the 1M2M as IoT platform. So now we have these two IoT platform that needs to also work together in the use case. So that's quite some uh, challenge there. So now let's come back to the architecture. So what are these IoT devices in this case? So the IoT devices are the vehicles itself. So one of the main I IoT devices is a vehicle. So if you look at the vehicle, they have an in-vehicle platform and provides quite a lot of services. So the most important ones, for example, when we think of AVP, it's a parking maneuvering service. Another one could be the motion planning service. And uh, for these services, for example, for the motion planning service, they need input. And it can be from, as Sven already mentioned, it can be from their sensors, but also if we have the internet, we can extend their range by, for example, having the information uh, from a remote parking spot, whether it is occupied or not. So such kind of input is needed for this motion planning service. And then, uh, so this has an IoT gateway, which interacts with the IoT platform to get this data. And then another, another service is the app itself. So the app can be used to start and stop uh, the application or send commands uh, to the vehicle uh, to get retrieve back the vehicle from the parking lot or send, send it to the parking lot. And so there is also a communication between the app and the IoT vehicle. And in the background, there are services uh, running, for example, the valet par pa parking ser service. So it's it has a user management service, parking management service, and also can support with the road selection service. I also mentioned that uh, with the IoT, we can connect other sensors. In our case, the other sensors are the infrastructural cameras. So these cameras on the buildings or in the parking lot, yeah, stream live uh, data, and then from there, some intelligent algorithms will process this data and then send out the information like the parking spot is occupied or the parking spot number X is free. And uh, in addition to that, we also have drones in the use case. So the drones can also provide maybe some places where the cameras cannot cover, the, dro the drones can easily fly and see the status and also update that, okay, whether the parking spot is free or uh, the obstacle, if there is any obstacle to that access roads to the parking parking lot. And so all these data coming are now stored in the IoT platform in different containers. And now when we look at more close with the data flow, we can see that, so the first, uh, the inf uh, this is just an example how we have implemented it in the uh, last one of the test fest we had in a few weeks back. So the infrastructural cameras uh, detect, sends their raw camera data information, and then our partner VComTech, they have an intelligent algorithm which is look, which is processing these camera images and then sends out the information like the parking spot status or obstacles. It's using an, and these algorithms are actually located uh, in the server. And uh, from there, we use a messaging protocol uh, called asynchronous messaging queuing protocol. So to send it to a task uh, parking spot entity. And from these 
ta task parking spot entity, it is sent to the IoT platform. But uh, as I mentioned, uh, the TNO a task vehicle can directly subscribe uh, to this message and then get it from the 1M2M platform. But the DLR vehicle is using a different platform, that's the IBM Watson platform. And to make it uh, interoperable, it's a bit more complex than this simple picture, but there is an interworking gate, uh, gateway or proxy, uh, which is translating uh, this message from uh, the uh, 1M2M platform to the IBM uh, Watson platform. And so then the data will be available at the IBM Watson platform. IBM is using a different messaging protocol called MQTT for their communication, whereas in the 1M, 1M2M it supports MQTT or the RESTful API, that's the HTTP, POST, GET, PUSH uh, uh, for, for, uh, for the communication. Now, uh, the task can also send this information directly to the IBM Watson platform for evaluation purpose. So this is basically the, the data communication flow. And in the case of drone, drone is also uh, sending this information directly to the IBM pl uh, Watson platform. So in summary, this IoT enables data sharing between multiple parties. And also in our use case, one of the complex challenge was to use two different uh, I IoT platform. And we have also demonstrated that their interworking can be made uh, successful. And this data sharing between these two platforms uh, are also working fine. And in our case, we have also used standardized data models uh, adapted from the Datex2 model. And then that is used for sending out this parking spot status or obstacles. And in the next one slide, just show how this data is stored in the different containers in the 1M2M platform. So you can see that this AE task is like a big container. Uh, and inside that, we can put a new container called AVP and there another container called parking spot entity and where the parking spot status. In this parking spot status, all these content instance about the updates of the parking spots are coming. And if you look at the right side of the picture, you can see uh, the message, but this is not the standard uh, JSON for, format adapted from the Datex2 model, but this is one of the preliminary versions we used in the uh, project. So if you look at the JSON message, you can see like the parking spot 0, 1, and 2 are available, whereas the 3, 4, and 5 are occupied. So this is the, uh, the basic structure, how we store this data and then may make it available to the different parties. Now, Jorg, Jorg from Vicom Tech will continue with the video surveillance part. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jorge Garcia and I'm going to present uh, the video surveillance sections. So uh, regarding, could, uh, regarding to the current next scenario in video surveillance, is totally different with respect to, for example, to the last 10 or 15 years. So now we can take advantage of the video data, not just to be used in with a safety or security application, but there are several new applications that we can use that kind, that kind of video, video data. Uh, one of them is, for example, the detection of free parking spot that uh, to know if there is availability to park a vehicle in a, in a parking lot. So the goal of this, this application is to recognize uh, available parking spot using video surveillance cameras that is uh, currently installed in the in a, in environment. So this technology is based on deep learning model uh, for example, the, the network that we are using now is a convolutional neural network together with a, with a classification step. So the, 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 the convolutional neural network is responsible to, to extract the discrimination features and use it to, 
to differentiate between a spot with vehicles and empty spots. So the novel in this work is the future, the future extraction techniques. These, these techniques are more powerful than feature designed by humans. So after we have a, a convolutional neural network, we, have, uh, we use a, a fully connected neural network to learn the discrimination between the two levels. In that case, we are using spot variables uh, and not uh, and not available spot. So, particularly, this deep learning model uh, had been trained using around uh, 500,000 images in order to to have a lot of uh, power in to detect uh, the the parking status regarding to to several several climate clim uh, weather conditions. So when we have a, a deep learning model which is able to differentiate between available or not available uh, parking spot, uh, we have developed uh, for, e for the current use case in, in Autopilot a real-time application that is able to send the parking spot status to the IoT. We send this information through the task services and then the task services are able to to, pu to publish that information in the in the IoT, and this uh, information can be used by the autonomous vehicles to to use that information. So, regarding to some uh, specific features of the IPP of the yeah of the, of the application, uh, for example, the application can be configured to check the parking status every certain time period. So this is Auto, uh, is this totally configured? And also, there is a, the application include uh, other features like uh, to be careful when uh, motion or other um, other situation can be uh, can be uh, can happen in the in the parking stop, in the parking spot. So in that case, we prefer to not update the status of the parking spot and wait to to uh, to to and uh, wait for a to change the status of the parking spot just when when the when the parking uh, yeah the the motion or or the image of the parking status is 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 not changing so currently the major problems that we have with this kind of application is possible occlusion with respect with the perspective of the of the camera if a particular parking spot is occluded by a some obstacle or even other cars the IP, the application is not able to to know the the status so the preference to to have a is to have a, a overview views of the environment and now I would like to to show you a sample of the of the application. This is the when this is the the first uh, the first uh, status of the of the of the parking spot uh, application, and we can see that when the application starts, we have to find its own parking spot. And the status is recognized by the by the application. In this case, these four cars, this sorry, these four parking spots are occupied, and these two parking spots is are free. So if we go ahead to to see, for example, a change in the parking spot, now we can see that a person is going to to the vehicle. And we can see if the car leaves the, the parking spot, the status of the of the parking spot will change. Now the car leaves the parking spot and the parking spot will be available 
in a period of time. So now we have available and this current status of this parking spot will be sent to the to the AOT to notify to notify that the parking spot is, is free. And as I say before, if we have some motion in the in the environment, for example, now a car is let me Uh, there is a car, but I can see now. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's just to it's just to show that uh, the motion in the in the image don't don't affect to the parking spots. Let me. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, but I cannot find where is the car moving in the video. Sorry. Well, okay, doesn't matter. In conclusion, is that uh, the uh, the parking spot application is able to to send the, the status of the parking spot to the iot and this information will be useful for for uh, sorry for um for the uh, autonomous vehicle to to use this information to part the, the vehicle so now uh, i'm gonna leave the tour to robert to explain the 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 next section about the, the drone. I hope you can see now my presentation about the drone application. That's the full screen. So basically, in addition to the video camera surveillance uh, just uh, presented, um, we use a drone um, as IoT device in the AVP use case. So basically, the drone itself does uh, actually the same as the uh, roadside unit cameras. Um, the drone as itself um, is a set of two things. It's a micro air vehicle or MAV and a ground station, which is basically a PC. And this entire system acts um, as an IoT device in the AVP use case. So basically, the MAV is able to navigate autonomously in um, the outdoor, but also uh, indoor when we have no GPS signal available. Um, the um, MAV sends uh, the information about the parking area, flying and hovering above the parking area, detecting empty parking spaces and um, occupied parking spaces. This information are detected by the cameras mounted to uh, the MAV and only the information that uh, parking area is uh, free or not is uh, sent to the IoT uh, platform. On the next slide, uh, you can see some basic information about the drone. Uh, it's uh, basically a very uh, light version of a drone, the weight is 2.6 kilograms and the flying uh, duration is approximately about 10 minutes. Uh, and it has two stereo cameras with a field of view from top to down of 240 degrees and from left to right uh, with 80 degrees. So basically um, I will show you on the next step a video how the drone works in the entire use case. Here we did first tests. So basically the idea is that an autonomous vehicle um, arrives at a drop-off position. The driver gets 
out of the vehicle and uses his smartphone. Uh, while the smartphone, uh, the drone um, will be started, so a request is sent to the IoT platform so that the drone starts and hovers uh, above the parking area and detects the empty uh, parking spot between the two vehicles. Then the car driver can confirm this parking slot and the, and the car drives in this empty parking area. And um, after that, the drone will um, fly back to its uh, original base station and will land. And here you see the parking of the vehicle. And the same um, happens then vice versa when the driver uh, picks up his car from a pickup area. So on the next slide, Sven will present the outlook. Um, Okay, thank you, uh, Robert. Could you make me uh, presenter again? Um, yes. Okay. So let's move ahead to uh, where we. Yeah, so this. Um, Finally, I um, give a, a, an outlook uh, uh, to the automated driving and uh, piloting. Um, what you can see here um, is a facility uh, uh, we have in, in Helmond, indoor. We use these facilities for, for different applications, but now we have made a setup for, uh, for developing uh, automated valid parking. And the main uh, research uh, topic is uh, uh, the maneuvering and positioning of the, the vehicle. And uh, well, we have to assume that not uh, always uh, a GPS connection will be available. And even when it is available, it may not have sufficient accuracy. So in this, uh, to overcome this, we uh, developed the, um, the vehicle to operate with uh, uh, LiDAR-based sensing using in the, in the SLAM uh, configuration, meaning that uh, uh, the LiDARs uh, are used to create an image of the uh, environment, a map. And at the same time, uh, it will uh, provide the position of the vehicle within that map. Um, so that means the simultaneous localization and mapping and of course these uh, lidars can also be used for obstacle detection which you can uh, see in this uh, animation uh, the other thing you can observe in this uh, animation is that the uh, maneuvering uh, in, for parking uh, is is, is uh, yeah it's a high maneuverability that you need in order to park the car at uh, the right uh, location so this is concerning the uh, positioning, which is uh, still a main uh, challenge to make it work. Um, there's quite a lot described in literature, but uh, to make it uh, operational or real time is not uh, an easy thing. And the other part that we um, uh, already uh, developed is um, allowing driving for uh, parking maneuvers in full uh, automated mode. Here you can see uh, uh, the inside of the car. It's uh, automated steering and automated speed. Um, the driver is in there, well, not only for safety reasons, but also to uh, select the gear from uh, forward driving to rearward driving. Um, and of course, in, in general, for automated driving, uh, we will start with forward driving. That's the most what you do. But of course, for parking, we, we need to consider also uh, backward driving. So this is um, this is th this development is still uh, uh, going on, and it's uh, it, it it is a, a big uh, challenge to, to really make that uh, work. Um, okay, but then um, to move forward, um, the autopilot uh, it's in the name is about piloting automated driving and uh, Internet of Things. 
And what you see in this screen is uh, the, the status we have uh, concerning the pilot execution um, in, in the brain port. So until now we have uh, organized two events for integration of the technologies of the different parties involved. We have to consider that in the brain port, um, uh, the uh, very large shared consortium is active in uh, uh, supporting the different use cases we have. We have about 15 uh, partners involved and uh, also a handful of uh, associate partners. So it's quite um, an organization and um, uh, yeah, not all the parties are uh, from, from the Netherlands, so uh, we really need to organize uh, an event to have everybody available at the same time. And we have done that in January and uh, uh, again uh, just a few weeks uh, ago. Uh, and there we also uh, made a step towards uh, pilot readiness uh, verification and validation uh, about functionality for, uh, for piloting. So in the piloting itself, uh, we, we are considering uh, at least two uh, system variants. Uh, in 2019, um, the main focus is on the service concepts and the automated driving uh, for uh, the, uh, the use cases, uh, individual use cases. Uh, whereas uh, for 2019, uh, we're looking at the integration of the different services. So, for instance, you can combine uh, car sharing, uh, with automated valid parking and platooning because you share a lot of the information and the logistics of the, uh, of the vehicle. Uh, but secondly, we are also uh, uh, will be extending the automated driving uh, for 2019. And finally, um, we will have public demonstrations in conjunction with the ITS 2019 conference in, in, in uh, Helmut Eindhoven area. So if you look uh, here in the, in the timeline, um, we are now at the, the midterm of the uh, of the project. Uh, we switch over from uh, development and go into the piloting and evaluation. The objective of piloting is to be able to evaluate the impact of IoT on automated driving. And here you can see the events that we planned. So we have a first piloting just after the summer in September, uh, mainly um, on a technical evaluation of the different uh, use cases and services, and in uh, December 2018, we have um, uh, an event with a local uh, workshop where, where we also have external audience and also look at other aspects for evaluation. Um, as I said, we will extend the functionality towards 2019. Uh, so we plan another uh, piloting event in, uh, in March and uh, the final piloting event um, in May. This is just a week. Uh, before the ITS uh, conference, it's also a preparation for the demonstrations will, which will be conducted at the 2019 ITS conference in Nelmut uh, Eindhoven. And then finally, the end of 2019 will also be uh, the end of the autopilot project. So I would uh, like to thank you for your attention. Um, when and of course, we are open uh, for questions. Um, in the meantime, uh, you can look at this um, animation. It's a simulation of uh, uh, the parking maneuvers, uh, meaning that uh, also the, um, uh, the trajectory generation from one parking spot to the other parking spot is uh, uh, fully autonomous. The car is uh, autonomous. It has the same uh, maneuverability as the, the real test car that we are uh, using. And um, uh, yeah, this is really a demonstration of what we uh, uh, can do. So yeah, I open the floor uh, for questions. So um, uh, Cecilia, maybe you can uh, take over on this part. Hello. Um, so we have actually at the moment only one question. And um, they are asking. Uh, Based on your experience, what is the latency of data getting to the vehicle in your architecture? Um, I'm not sure to whom is this the question to address, but if any of the panelists can just answer it. Yeah, I would say that uh, maybe DLR, you have the most experience with this data exchange in, in, in your system. Could you give some uh, 
indication of um, what kind of latencies we have to consider? Um, up to my old knowledge, it's um, approximately 500 milliseconds. Yes, and I, and I believe it's also related to the constitution of the uh, IoT uh, network. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so, but uh, Amy, could you explain a bit uh, uh, how that will work in IoT? I mean, if you don't find the answer in, in, in the first IoT service, I believe there's a, uh, the methodology is also to uh, expand the search to other networks. Uh, could you explain a bit how that would work? Uh, I mean, the, the question is like, uh, what is the minimum latency you can achieve or is it like because uh, uh, depending upon the service uh, for example if you want uh, to have a parking spot uh, status update you don't need to update it every uh, millisecond or every 100 milliseconds so you can uh, have latency up to a few seconds uh, to update that one but we have other application for example if you have like uh, really interested in some kind of uh, obstacle information and uh, uh, the platform currently supports like uh, it can um, go up to uh, 100 millisecond 150 millisecond is a rough round time estimation uh, i have uh, checked that is when when this cloud uh, is hosted somewhere far apart but uh, we are also planning to change uh, that one to an edge computing where this can improve significantly so the latency can uh, come down to much uh, lower numbers yes and in, in, in any case we um, um, we, we consider different levels of driving as, as indicated in the beginning we um, we have the operational uh, uh, where is the this is the overview so we have the uh, strategic, tactical, and operational um, driving. So for the, the steer and speed control, uh, we can only accept latencies in communication of, uh, um, well, I would say 10, 10 milliseconds, that, that order of magnitude. But when it comes to the decision make, making, um, so 500 milliseconds is half a second. That's still enough time to anticipate on, on um, uh, situations on the road where you have to choose uh, the different lane or maybe it's just uh, uh, the speed that you are driving. So uh, the latency definitely is also impacting where uh, you can use uh, IoT. Uh, the other aspect uh, where you can use IoT is really uh, the trustworthiness uh, of the data. Um, if it's, uh, uh, I mean, you cannot uh, rely your choice fully uh, on data unless you uh, uh, can can trust uh, the data. So that's it's not only about only the latency, but also the trustworthiness and even the accuracy of the data that will define how you will use that in uh, automated driving. There is another question on the regarding the video surveillance technology. Um, uh, the question it said it seems that your algorithm take more than five seconds to update the status of uh, on occupation. Um, are they just asking uh, if it's that not too long? Yes, uh, let me explain. Uh, the time that we need to, to check one image is around one millisecond. So the, neur the convolutional neural network spend one millisecond to check uh, around 10 uh, or 10, entre 10 and 20 uh, parking spots, depending on the size of the, of the image. But uh, uh, we understand that the application, uh, the frequency is not uh, the, the the when the the parking spot change the, the the velocity of the car to 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 be occupied again is not so high it's not so uh, demanding so uh, we uh, we choose for example uh, to uh, check the parking status every five sec five second but I mean uh, depends on of the application. There is another question regarding the indoor autonomous parking. Uh, does a uh, pre-loaded indoor map is needed? Um, 
Well, no. <laughs> At least it will depend on the uh, on the type of system that you have. So uh, we have noted that uh, when we use the, uh, the our test vehicle with lidars, uh, it, it takes uh, just one round of driving, and you have an initial impression of the map. But the methodology uh, also uh, relies on uh, uh, repeated detections um, uh, to increase the confidence level and also the accuracy of um, uh, of the environment. However, in, in this, this indoor is, is quite a simple uh, and straightforward environment. Uh, when you go uh, towards the uh, the real outdoor application, uh, the, the the environment is not so nice. So let's say if you go here to the we can you can see we have very nice uh, uh, red and white marked barriers. The color doesn't matter for the lidar, but then we, but um, it's, it's the, the, the dimension of this is really nice and straight. So that's very easy to uh, determine your position. When you go to the real outdoor situation, you don't have these very nice uh, straight uh, markings for the lidars. So there, the position is much more challenging, and um, uh, so you, you you do need to have to, uh, to have a baseline map, uh, but you also need to know which parking spots are open uh, beforehand uh, or which are not open, because otherwise, uh, yeah, the, the, let's say the system would get confused because uh, at some point there he is detecting obstacles which are not in the map. So there really is a uh, some some kind of interaction or update sequence in in understanding the baseline the baseline layout layout of the park will of course not change but what uh, needs to be preloaded is uh, which uh, spaces are occupied by uh, cars because otherwise you cannot do the localization. There is another question: uh, What are the positioning technologies that you have investigated? I believe uh, this is used for the uh, for the drone. Uh, Robert, could you comment on that? Um, yes, I can comment on that. Well, actually, not yet. Um, so the drone is basically flying on based on two um, use cases or situations, as mentioned on the slides. It can fly outdoors, so it uses the GPS positioning, and when it flies indoors. It uses um, um, visual markers um, surrounding the base station, and then based on that, um, it can fly around uh, localizing itself in correspondence to the base station. Um, but uh, radio-based technology we uh, didn't um, implement it yet and did not test it yet. Yes, I've, I've seen that the, uh, some of your colleagues brought some antennas, but I, I believe they did not use it. Uh, we we are actually using ultra wideband solution on the on the test vehicles in in, in addition to the current uh, uh, ra radar systems. So that mm -hmm. could also provide uh, positioning information. And, and and for the outdoor application, we um, uh, currently uh, uh, rely on RTK GPS. Um, there's a, a, a base station uh, uh, from the GPS system itself, but there's also an RTK GPS service provided uh, through 3.4G uh, by TAS. Uh, Amy, do you, have, do you have some details about that system that you provide? I mean, Amy, um, you're still on the call? Uh, yes. Uh, I believe that uh, I, I, the entry solution. Yes, uh, with the correction signals, I think uh, we can uh, go down to a few centimeters like accuracy. Yeah, so the, well, we, we do consider different uh, positioning uh, uh, technologies and uh, for sure uh, during the, uh, the pilot, uh, uh, piloting, we will use multiple technologies uh, simultaneously uh, in order to have redundancies. Um, it's it's um, uh, it's early times in uh, for automated driving, so we um, uh, we will not rely on a single methodology uh, for positioning. Uh, secondly, uh, on on the campus itself, uh, and the cameras. Of course, you can use the cameras for um, um, detection of available parking spaces, but the cameras can also provide some indication. 
uh, of where, where uh, the vehicle is or where the vehicle itself uh, is. Uh, accuracy is not uh, uh, too, too, it's not very accurate, but anyway, it's another source of information uh, that can provide uh, if, uh, the, the local uh, position of the of the vehicle. And of course, at, at, at parking maneuvers, the uh, the speed of motion is uh, uh, very low, um, so it's also not so uh, not too much uh, time critical. In any case, for the for the parking itself, uh, it is required to have last meter uh, collision avoidance, which which um, well, it's more or less standard technology uh, on modern cars now, and they are already uh, equipped with. Um, uh, ultrasonic sensors and have self-parking capabilities uh, when they are positioned close to a parking spot. So, but there are different uh, positioning technologies uh, considered. Yes. Uh, next question: Do you plan to demonstrate uh, IoT AVP in real traffic situation, uh, notably uh, autonomous driving cars parking when other cars move into the parking lots? Well, this is um, uh, it, it is considered. Uh, in any case, um, uh, when we do that, uh, the, the other cars will always be operated by people involved in the project. So we will not conduct it in a in a, a real open public parking space. Um, but uh, it, it, it is planned also to look at um, uh, situations where other cars may be driving around, but uh, once again, there will not be uh, any general public uh, people uh, and for sure there will not be uh, allowed to be any pedestrians on the parking area. Okay, the um, AD system you showed is implemented uh, within the OEME car system or it is an external one? Um, the the system, the automated driving system that, well, there, there are different uh, vehicles used for uh, automated driving. So when we consider the, the test vehicle of TNO, I know most about that one. It's basically um, a standard uh, uh, vehicle um, where we change the controls of the vehicle. But uh, uh, apart from one extra camera, we did not even uh, extend the sensing. Um, for well, apart yeah, well we we don't use the lidar for this automated driving function at this moment. Um, so to a large extent, it's just an OEM uh, vehicle where we change the uh, uh, commands to the steering and the the drive system. Um, uh, Robert, so uh, how is that done on your test vehicle? Basically, it's very similar to yours, um, but in addition, we have an uh, own developed uh, in-vehicle architecture we are using in addition to the OEM architecture which is running on the vehicle. So uh, it's a bit more than only the OEM uh, vehicle we have uh, running on that on the car. So this gives, gives us a bit more of flexibility in um, bringing the AVP use case uh, on the road. Yeah, we we, um, we experienced that uh, the, the capability of the standard vehicle components is limited is limiting actually what we can achieve with uh, uh, with automated driving. Um, but um, yeah, uh, the alternative is to uh, extend the the vehicle systems with uh, additional actuators, etc. But then it it limits the use on public uh, roads. So the advantage, well, or, or the situation we have is that we uh, we only have a software change on the uh, uh, on the vehicle to uh, for the controls, and we can deactivate that, uh, that uh, which allows us also to use the same vehicles on uh, public roads. And for certain functions that we have developed, we have road exemptions that also allows us to do uh, experiments experiments on public uh, road. We have just received another question uh, regarding when uh, any of these cars will be available. You mean, uh, uh, well, when, when you look at automated developed parking, uh, it, it has been announced that it, uh, it will be uh, provided 
uh, by the end of this year by one of the OEMs. Um, but that's a system that mainly, uh, as far as I could tell from the information I've seen, is uh, re relying on, on the infrastructure uh, sensors to be added to the um, uh, parking. So the car itself is more or less a standard car, but there's the sensing is then in the uh, in the infrastructure. Uh, the methodology uh, where we are really focusing on is to, to find the balance between sensing from the vehicle, um, uh, sensing from the environment, but then uh, se sensor types that could be exploited through the IoT uh, system. Um, uh, really also looking at, at, at uh, what, like the camera system we are now um, uh, using for valet parking application. It's just a simple surveillance system. So look at the uh, early deployment, low cost options as well. Okay, I think that's, that's all the questions we have. Okay, well, if this was the last question, then uh, it seems that uh, we, <laughs> we are stopping at uh, five o'clock with the uh, uh, presentation. Um, Cecilia, could you maybe do the final uh, slide that we see here? Yes, so we would like to thank uh, all the participants for being here um, attending this uh, webinar. And we invite all of you to stay in touch with us uh, through the website, so www.autopilot.project.eu or follow us on the social media. We are on Twitter and LinkedIn. Um, also to subscribe to our newsletter where we're going to be uh, sending news related to uh, automated driving and information about our pilot sites. Um, this recording will be also uh, will be available on the website. Um, so we will be inviting you to keep uh, in touch with us and connect it and you will uh, have all the, all the information to, uh, it's interesting. Uh, thank thanks to everyone. I think that's okay. Well, anyway, thank you for hosting and uh, giving us the opportunity uh, to make this uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye.